In this edition of Beef Monthly, we'll be talking about some interesting research studies, foreign trade, waters of the United States, risk management, and land values and headline news. We'll also be talking about upcoming management tips, what do we do with what's left in the bottom of the freezer, and a case study dealing with toxicity potential when we dispose of pressure-treated lumber from our aging infrastructures. We begin headline news with a summary of a study that recently came across my desk written by Justin Sexton, Vice President of Strategy for Performance Livestock Analytics. The article's title was Technologies for Sorting Cattle. I was attracted to this article because I thought there was going to be some new sensor, machine algorithm, or maybe even a robotic cowboy. What I quickly learned was it was about a simple way of getting cattle on and off of a trailer. The study was conducted by Stella Maras Hurtas and co-workers using a sorting stick, electric prod, shouting, and some combination of these to move cattle. In this study, they measured loading times, success rate, and carcass bruising. Since carcass bruising is positively correlated with loading speed, it's a pretty good measure of animal handling techniques. An interesting side note is that this study was conducted in Uruguay with a leaner type of cattle that are more prone to bruising and cattle with a much larger flight zone than what we're typically used to working with because of the extensive environment in which they are managed. After loading, 82% of the loading events were scored as good, 15.7% were scored as neutral, and 2.4% were considered bad due to extenuated, extenuating circumstances, extended times, and what they called problem encounters during loading. Neutral and bad loading outcomes were associated with the increased use of sorting sticks, prods, and shouting, while the use of flags, rattle paddles, and low-stress animal handling was associated with positive outcomes. This study suggests that the use of flags and rattle paddles provide the best opportunity to communicate visual intent to the cattle without making contact. Sticks and prods, on the other hand, require body contact to communicate direction. When movement devices are used to make contact, there is a strong likelihood that one of two things will occur. One, you're tra transmitting the desired direction to the cattle, but too late. Or number two, the handler is trying to speed up animal movement when animal movement is already going in the correct direction. In both cases, negative outcomes are more likely. Unloading cattle should be less eventful than loading since confined cattle have only a singular exit direction. In 29.3% of the project's unloading events, there were too many people trying to help. Results suggest that carcass bruising was lowest when only one person provided quiet cues to the cattle without a movement device. All other unloading strategies were similar and resulted in more carcass bruising. This study suggests that the next time you move cattle, there are a few simple practices to remember. Make sure you're using a tool, such as a flag or a paddle, that provides the cattle with visual clues of what you want them to do. This means positioning yourself in the right place so that they can see you and then apply visual cues that can be re easily interpreted by the cattle. Our second story deals with trade agreement with Japan. On August 25th, President Trump announced a bilateral trade agreement in principle with Japan that includes both beef and pork. Under this agreement, the tariff on U.S. beef would be lowered from the current 38.5% to 9% over multiple years and phases. This agreement would be a significant win for the beef industry. Japan is a major destination for U.S. beef exports in terms of both volume and dollar value. About 28% of U.S. beef exports in 2018 ended up in Japan which makes it our top beef export market with a total value of just over $2 billion. The tariff on U.S. beef entering Japan is currently 38.5% and in 
and was as high as 50% in recent years. Meanwhile, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and Mexico are phasing down from a 26.6% tariff down to nine and is scheduled to continue downward. The proposed agreement between the US and Japan would level the playing field. In a similar example, the current bilateral trade agreement between the US and South Korea is reducing the tariff on US beef to zero over the next seven years. The announcement of this agreement is an important first step, but the deal is not yet signed. It is expected that the deal could be signed at the United Nations General Assembly Summit later this month. When that happens, it will be interesting to learn more about the details. Also in the news is a decision in Georgia Federal Court that the Environmental Protection Agency, which is EPA, and the Army Corps of Engineers violated the Administrative Act and violated the Clean Water Act. This has, a, has effectively eliminated what has been called WOTUS, or the Waters of the United States, from the Federal Register in its current form. And a replacement rule is expected by late this year that will be more logical and add clarity. We also see a story from the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, that says he has launched an investigation through the Packers and Stockyards Division into price, pricing of beef following the fire at the Tyson Processing Facility in Holcomb, Kansas. Following the fire, beef prices plummeted and the investigation will be looking for evidence of price manipulation, collusion, restriction of competition, and other unfair practices. Along the same line, the USDA Risk Management Agency is underwriting Livestock Risk Protection Insurance, or LRP, to help protect livestock producers from losses due to market price volatility. Ryan Milhong, University of Missouri Extension Economist, says that while farmers have historically utilized crop insurance, livestock producers haven't done much. This risk management tool can help protect producers from financial losses when sale prices drop and coverage levels can be adjusted. These new policies fit small beef producers and are more flexible. The premium subsidy, which has been 13%, now ranges from 20 to 35%, depending on the plan chosen. University of Missouri agricultural economists have written an extension publication, G459, which explains the LRP and other livestock and dairy risk plans. The newly updated four-page guide is available for free download, and the link to this publication is provided in the show notes immediately below this video. It should be noted that LRP insurance coverage only covers market prices. It does not compensate for other losses such as death by disease or lightning. In our last news story, we have the August 2019 Purdue Land Value Survey that was published by the Department of Agricultural Economics. The report shows that farmland values decreased by 5.3% for top quality land, 0.9% for average quality land, and remained stable for poor quality land when 2017 was compared to 2018. Cash rents also declined in 2018. Top quality farmland experienced a 4.6% decline in cash rents, followed by a 1.4% and 1.2% decline in average and poor farmland, respectively. And that's a wrap on this month's headline news. In this month's uh, consumer focus, uh, I've asked Steve Butler from Butler Meat Processing to join us for a discussion about what do you do with what's at the bottom of the freezer, okay? Particularly for those of us that, that buy freezer beef or we raise our own freezer beef, we end up with some things at the bottom of the freezer after the steaks are gone and the hamburger's gone, and we got pieces of meat that just haven't been used yet. For example, here's a beef liver. Steve, what do we do with a, with a beef liver? You know, 
when we take cuttings from customers and they say, well, we don't want the beef tongue, the liver, heart tongue, tail, and we say, well, it goes with the beef, of course, you know. We, uh, it's just one of those options of, of not being able to work with the soup kitchen anymore like we did. Uh, but anyway, of course, you're going to get all of that. And the beef liver, a lot of probably the younger generation just hasn't acquired a taste for that. If a grandma and grandpa raised you on bringing you up and eating this, then, you know, it's something that's a staple, so to speak. But it is going to be items that are going to be the last to pull out of the freezer. The beef liver, you know, there's liver and onions, you flour, salt and pepper, fry it. Um, I don't have a lot of recipes for some of these items, um, but the beef heart, you can Google and bring something up. There's uh, several. Uh, that you can see it's out there on the net uh, the beef tongue can be boiled and skinned um, it can be pickled my dad used to do that and give people recipes for pickled beef tongue and the oxtail this is the one that I do favor the most because we use it at home and when we make vegetable soup we don't make it without the oxtail because of the richness the flavor the broth stock that it makes. You bet. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about that that richness, okay? And part of that's kind of the bone marrow. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That, that comes with those yeah. so, more bony pieces. So the soup bone, okay, the leg bone, the cross cut shank that you're gonna see there. So right there in the middle, that is the bone marrow right there. You can actually see that and there's a lot of nutrient value today. Doctors are promoting you know, beef marrow bones. And uh, so if you're doing this, of course, when we do a cutting, we always ask the people, do you want to save this for soup stock and those type of things? And if they don't, then what we do, we just trim the meat off the bone and then that's added to the lean because it's not a lot of gristle, sinew types on the leg bone like there is on the boiling beef. This is a boiling beef that comes off the plate or the belly area. It has a cartilage, okay? It's soft, it's not bone like the short ribs, okay? It's a little bit softer, but the meat is down on the chuck end. So the meat is tender, but there's lots of fat, okay? So you got all this fat to separate. You have to work at it to do that and trim it up nice so you're not adding fat this uh, cartilage could a little bit get into the hamburger meat sure. and then you've got all these little fragments that we don't want to have in our hamburger. The short ribs the same way. This is the inner side of it where the skirt would be attached on the inside so you can kind of see some diaphragm meat right there. This would be trimmed off and then you could use this meat. So this would be great for uh, uh, beef and noodles. Uh, just boiling, you can braise the short ribs, find a recipe, Google it, you know, put it down in the pan and braise both sides of it and then put it in the oven. So this meat is very rich and very flavorful. High-end steakhouses are offering braised short ribs today. You know, and, you know, to put that in the hamburger, there's a lot of knife times. Oh, yeah. To, to be able to take that a little amount of lean out it's labor from, and from all the bones and all the fat. Yep. Could I throw that in a crock pot? Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. And, and make a little heat, moist heat. It's it's going to separate. And of course, you got a little work to do. You're going to have to separate all that. But the stock that you're going to get from that. And uh, of course, we made a pot of vegetable soup I did yesterday. And I used the cross cut shanks. So you can actually see that marrow or bone marrow has just dissipated and it is now in the pot of vegetable soup. This is the oxtail, so it's the joint right in there between, and you can just see how that meat has come apart off of the knuckle there yeah. between that tail. And that meat is very, very rich and it makes just great stock. So there again, you can see here's some of the cooked marl that just didn't quite get out of there. Yeah. So the richness of everything and, um, got a pot of vegetable soup here so yeah. 
Steve, you know, anything else that you can think of that, you know, might be at the bottom of the freezer that we ought to think about? You know, I I think about the pot roast, mm -hmm. all right, and, and you know, with, with today's active lifestyles and all those things, you know, the pot roast, if you, if you have to cook it like the way grandma used to cook it, you know, it takes all that. But I think our consumers ought to think about, hey, you know, that, that roast could go in the crock pot, all right, with, you know, maybe some carrots and some potatoes and some green beans and peas and whatever, and if you kind of measure out those things the night before, yeah. you know, in five or ten minutes, you can put your roast in a crock pot, you can dump all your vegetables in, in five or ten minutes, go to work, and when you get home, yeah. you've got supper. That's right. We so, need to utilize the crock pot more today, but everybody, like you said, it's such a fast pace, and we may leave that in there because we think that we have to do it that way, but put it in the crock pot. You know, I've, I've heard people say that, you know, about 85% of the homes at 4.30 in the afternoon don't know what we're going to have to talk about. You know, and so, you know, doing some of these things at 4.30 for a 5.30 or a 6 o'clock supper probably doesn't work, but crock pot, you know, stews, yeah. you know, those kinds of things kind of make some sense. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, thank you so much, no I'm glad you guys came over. This month's Ask Dr. Ron question is going to take a little different twist. It's going to be a recent case study dealing with arsenic toxicity. You might ask, why and how does that affect me and my beef operation? To answer these questions, we need to realize that many producers have aging infrastructures that need to be replaced. Specifically, we're talking about treated wood used in such things as barn construction, playground equipment, and fence posts. I've asked Dr. Janice Krzyzewski, a board-certified large animal internal medicine veterinarian and faculty member in the Purdue College of Veterinary Medicine. Her specialty is mineral metabolism and endocrinology, and she's here to help us understand arsenic toxicity and what, it, what we can do to minimize the risk. Janice, thank you so much for being here uh, and, and talking about this potential problem that we may all face. So thanks for inviting me, Ron. Um, yes, we recently examined three steers from the same farm. And what the producer found is that within 24 hours of each other, the owner noted that they had developed neurological problems and didn't want to eat. Um, initially, the steers couldn't walk properly, but that rapidly progressed to a complete inability to stand. So basically within a day, the owner went from having three healthy growing steers to three that were down, unable to get up and unresponsive to external stimuli. They also developed bloating and severe diarrhea. When we ran blood tests, we could see that they had liver damage and were suffering from kidney failure. We also saw that their blood magnesium levels were normal, which ruled out grass tetany, which was initially our number one rule out. Um, one steer died on the way to the veterinary hospital, so um, we didn't actually get to examine him at all. The other two were treated. We tubed them to relieve the bloat placed them in IV fluids to flush out their kidneys, um, and they started to respond to that treatment. Um, it then came out that the owner had burned an old swing set in the pasture and that the steers had access to those ashes. Um, one of the steers was not as severely re affected as the other two, and it did respond to the intravenous fluid therapy. The other two did not make it. So what's the significance of the ashes in this case? Well, the ashes were analyzed and they had extremely high levels of CCA, which is chromated copper arsenate. So this was treated lumber. And when the lumber is burned, the arsenic in that lumber becomes very concentrated in the ashes. Mm -hmm. Also, um, the heating action of burning changes the chemical makeup of arsenic and makes it a more toxic form. Um, so when we found high arsenic levels in the ashes and in the liver tissues of the steers that died, that confirmed our diagnosis of arsenic toxicity. And um, this is not actually that rare. This is the third herd of cattle with arsenic toxicosis that we've seen at Purdue in the last six years. In every case, the cows were exposed to contaminated ashes from treated wood that had been burned in their pastures. Well, I think at this point, we probably need to give our viewers just a little bit of a background um, on CCA-treated lumber, all right, in order to kind of understand this issue. 
Since the 1940s, arsenic, chromium, and copper were combined to create chrominated copper arsenic, or CCA, as a pressure-treated wood preservative. This wood was commonly used in building decks, playground equipment, picnic tables, landscape timbers, fences, posts, patios, and walkways. And arsenic is a naturally occurring element that is widely distributed uh, in the soils and minerals, and it's been used both as a pesticide and as a word treatment. In 2003, the EPA and the lumber companies agreed to discontinue the use of CCA-treated lumber in residential construction to protect the health of humans and the environment. The EPA, however, determined that existing structures containing CCA did not pose an unreasonable risk and that removal or replacement of existing structures was really not warranted. Because CCA is such a good word preservative, pressure-treated CCA lumber can still be used for commercial, industrial, and agricultural purposes. This means that fence posts and support structures for agricultural use can still be used um, as a treated lumber. As these infrastructures around the farm age, and we are thinking about replacing them, I think we need to think about the cautions of how do we handle the disposal of these products. I recently asked the Indiana Department of Environmental Management, or IDEM, about how do you dispose of treated lumber? And they said that it's legal to dispose of CCA treated lumber in landfills. I think it's interesting to note that there are really two general types of wood treatments. One is an, a water-based treatment, the other one is an oil-based. The water-based category contains not only the CCA, but also lumber treated with micronized copper, uh, alkaline copper, quaternary um, copper, ACQ, and copper azole. Azole, okay. Uh, the oil-based category includes copper naphthalene, uh, creosote, and pentachlorophenol. So the question I'd like to ask you is, do we really need to be concerned about the disposal of these other treatment, these other wood treatments as well? Yes. Um, all of those compounds are toxic to one degree or another. Um, so usually these compounds, when they're treated in lumber, are very tightly bound to the wood, so they don't leach out. You don't really have to worry about ground around a fence post, say, or something like that. Um, although. It is recommended that they not come in contact with food sources or water that is going to be used to drink. Um, but those chemicals are still highly toxic in the wood and they will stay that way for years or even decades. And when you burn the wood, that then releases those toxins as the cellulose burns away. Um, they are also released when this wood is composted. So they should not be used for composting. So kind of the rotting wood and the composting of wood becomes a problem. So yes. let's recap for our audience. What do we need to do to properly dispose of treated lumber to protect our animals and the environments from potential toxic outcomes? Um, well, first of all, you should never burn treated lumber, particularly not in a pasture or any place where animals have access to it. Cows seem to like the taste of ashes. Maybe it's salty, um, but they will go out of their way to eat it. Um, mm -hmm. And then once they ingest it, then you see all the toxic effects. Um, and as you know, you did the right thing by contacting item. Certainly wherever anybody is, you should contact local um, authorities, either environmental protection or some other um, group that deals with disposal and see how to safely dispose of them in your area. Maybe even your local landfill. Or, yeah, yep, yeah they can yeah. go into landfills, usually. You know, and if you're gonna, you know, if by chance you're gonna burn, okay, make sure you do it in a wrong, in, in, in a place that's not exposed to the animals exactly. and probably bury it. Yes, Okay. Yeah, it's probably. Janice, thank you so much for joining us today to provide your insight and expertise on this important, but probably seldom thought about problem. Um, you're very welcome. In this month's upcoming programs and events, we will have details for each program listed in the show notes directly below this video. The first one is the Master Cattlemen Program. This year it's going to be held in the northwest part of the state and will be hosted by Brian Overstreet in Jasper County. Their program will be 11 highly interactive sessions long and each session lasts for three hours. 
The program runs from early December through February, and an enrollment is listed limited to 25 participants. The second event is the 10 regional beef meetings hosted by the Indiana Beef Cattle Association and Purdue Extension during December and January. The meeting schedule and times are listed in show notes below. The next event is Hoosier Beef Congress. Okay, Hoosier Beef Congress is slated for December 6th through the 8th, and the important dates are the sale deadline is October 15th, and the junior registration deadline for shows is November 1. The next event, I've asked Dr. Nick Mitten from uh, the Felden Purdue Ag Center and Beef Systems Specialist to come in and visit with us for just a minute about the upcoming IBEP bull test station sale and replacement heifer sale that will be held Saturday, October 19th, starting at 2 o'clock. Hi folks, I'm Nick Minton, uh, Beef Systems Specialist for Purdue University uh, and also the on-site coordinator uh, and secretary treasurer for the Indiana Beef Evaluation Program, also referred to as IBEP. Uh, here to give you a brief update on where we're at on the current uh, 2019 summer test. Uh, right now, uh, we're essentially over three quarters of the way through the test. Um, we have 64 bulls on test and those bulls will weigh off tests on September 23rd. Um, and then following that week, uh, after we conduct the structural soundness and disposition uh, evaluations, as well as the breeding soundness exams, uh, we'll arrive at the number of bulls that are, will sell on October the 19th at the Springville Feeder Auction in Springville, Indiana. Um, with that being said, we're, we're looking at about 36 bulls um, with prior to the breeding soundness exams and, and structural soundness evaluations. Uh, that'll sell on uh, September the, or excuse me, October the 19th. Uh, and then also with that sale, um, due, since it's a smaller test, uh, we work with uh, the Springville Feeder Auction um, and in can also selling heifers. And that, so the uh, virgin um, unbred heifers will sell uh, prior to the bull sale. And, and those females will be consigned by a number of producers uh, here in the southern part of, of Indiana, predominantly from uh, Lawrence County. And so um, there, there's opportunity to for, for producers across the state of Indiana, but especially here in the, in the southern part of the state to come and, and uh, if they need a few replacement females to purchase that through the sale, as well as find a, uh, a bull that's been thoroughly evaluated um, for growth for, for performance, uh, structural soundness and breeding soundness exams. Um, to go back on those females as well as uh, into the cow herd uh, to add uh, increase the genetic integrity integrity of their herd uh, for years to come. And so with that being said, uh, I appreciate the time uh, for you tuning in. Um, and as always, uh, the gates are always open here at Felton Purdue Ag Center where the bull test is open, uh, where the bull, bull test is located. So feel free to stop by uh, or pass the word on, word on that folks can stop by uh, at any time to view the bulls. Thank you for watching our program. We hope you found it to be valuable for your operation. Please join us again for the next edition on Friday, October 18th for more insight into the issues that impact our businesses and our way of life. Until then, have a great month. And please tell your friends and fellow producers about our beef sites, beefmonthly.com, thebeefcenter.com, thebeefblog.com, and beeftips.info. These websites are posted in the show notes directly below this video for easy access. Please feel free to subscribe and receive an email notification and an alert when a new edition of this video podcast is published by going to beefmonthly.com, clicking on the email subscription, followed by a click on the small bell icon that will appear to appear enable notification and then hit the thumbs up by like button if you enjoy the program. We welcome any comments and or suggestions you might have. 
For questions you would like to have answered on beef-related topics, please send an email to askdrron at purdue.edu. This has been a production of the Purdue University Department of Animal Science with support from the Indiana Beef Cattle Association. And before we go, I'd like to mention a fundraising event for Ethan Lamont, who was diagnosed in July of this year with brain cancer. Interestingly, his dad in March of 2018 was also diagnosed with brain cancer. And obviously they're having some d tough times uh, with the treatments at Cincinnati Children's Hospital and then all of the associated uh, expenses associated with that. So on um, October 19th, from 4 to 8 o'clock, in Lanesville Heritage Building, they will be doing a ribeye supper sponsored by the Harrison County Cattlemen's Association for $10. They'll have a silent auction, a live auction, music by the Full House Band, and a beef raffle. So if you get a chance, you might consider uh, looking at the uh, information posted in show notes. And thank you. This presentation was a production of the Animal Science Department at Purdue University.